hello, hello, hello. Welcome to our new and improved time, 9 p.m. Oh my goodness, I know a lot of you are like 10.30 is late. I heard you, boy. I had a tough time too, uh, staying up that late and then talking for an hour and a half and then not being able to go back to bed um, after that. But uh, we started something, gosh, I don't know, uh, Kevin, how many months ago when the whole shutdown started to happen? Was, has Three. this been our fourth month? Three months? Okay. Oh, yeah. And um, we've just had a wonderful success uh, just kind of being with you and um, uh, just more personal outreach, which I just thought, um, Boy, wouldn't I like to spend more time with the people who have supported me all these years and continue to watch my show. So now that we're starting this at 9 p.m., we are doing something slightly differently. We are no longer um, doing this uh, coinciding with Create TV, although Places to Love does still air at 10.30, right, Kevin? Every Wednesday on Create TV. That's right. Um, but this is a little different. So what we're going to do is I thought I would just sort of do more of behind the scenes, more what we were thinking, how we choose places. Um, I have been doing this for 20 years hosting travel shows and have, uh, have put all that experience of being with people from all around the world into places to love. So I thought what a great way to actually show an episode and you still use that as our base of jumping off points of conversation and uh, also to kind of tell you what we were thinking here, maybe things that did not go the way we planned, but still worked out well, and just kind of give you a behind the scenes, fresh personal look um, at what is really a, a personal show. Um, it's, it's interesting, I would say that um, I open it up on Instagram, I'm like, if you have any questions for me to ask, shoot, you know, maybe I'll ask them online. And I would say the, the most common question we got, Kevin, was how do we choose our locations? Right? How do we choose if we have the entire world at our disposal? Um, how do we how do we choose? And it's it's a lot, or it's exactly how you choose your vacation um, and where you go. And that is, we have a budget, and our budget is dictated by our phenomenal sponsors of places to love. Uh, we have sponsorship. We receive funding from them, and you'll see them soon. Uh, so I won't get into them right now. But they give us a budget, and we get to go wherever we want with that budget. So we kind of break it out. We look at the world, literally the globe. It's like, I feel like we're like those Elon, <laughs> we've got the globe and we're just spinning it and where should we go here and let's go here. Uh, but we kind of break it up to, you know, we want our bucket list destinations, these far off places that maybe you dream for five years and plan for five years to finally go to and save up enough money to dream about and then go to. We pepper that with really great um, sort of travel really like known specific travel destinations and um, to shine a different light on them. Uh, maybe that you haven't seen because they're just kind of touristy places. And then my favorite is we go for the complete unknowns, places that they're not maybe unknown to you, but as a travel destination, they're not even considered. But my mission is to show you, yes, they can be. Everything, uh, almost every place can be uh, travel worthy. Right. And so if we have a different perspective of approaching a place um, based on that, then it's not just about having a lot of money to travel. Um, so we want to show travel as something that is approachable, that you can either plan many years for, that you can go away next summer for or, you know, next weekend if you had the time. Obviously, due to these pandemic times, um, you can't just get up and go anywhere. And uh, that is another reason why we wanted to continue these Facebook Lives because um, another question I got in my Instagram, and if you have questions on Facebook, please type them in, I'll, I'll answer them, um, is that, you know, it, how is the pandemic affecting the travel industry? And quite honestly, it is catastrophic. It is 10 times the power and, um, and devastation of 9-11 of and why I really feel like these Facebook Lives are important and showing our show is important is to reiterate constantly that when people say that the travel industry is failing, they're, they're not just talking about like the Deltas of the world and the Marriott's and the Carnival Cruise Lines. Um, we're talking about mom and pops. We're talking about one woman businesses, um, small businesses um, across the United States and of course the world, but even right here in the United States, especially in the United States. Um, we just want to show that these people are still out there. Uh, they're still, uh, you know, patiently waiting for travel to come back and they deserve our time. 
And so that's what this is about, is just sort of uh, giving um, a, a positive, uh, you know, a half hour to an hour, however long we're gonna spend here, just talking about travel and how wonderful it is, but also giving you sort of more of a technical approach as well, if you'd like it, um, more of, of, of just what we were thinking. So then if we can go anywhere and we have those um, sort of, you know, bucket list, great travel destinations and then complete unknowns in the travel world, I think I think Houston falls under that. That's a travel destination. Um, people don't normally uh, associate Houston, Texas, as a place to travel to, and that's why I wanted to go there. So a lot of people are like, why Houston? Um, Houston is the most ethnically diverse city in the United States. There is no one majority, uh, which I find fascinating. It is also um, I've got a fly here that just won't leave me alone. Um, it's also the number one refugee um, city in the uh, United States. All refugees uh, coming into the United States come through Houston, um, are sort of processed, if that's the, you know, a, an apt word. And um, so I found that these dynamics of the city were fascinating to me. And I thought, how can we as a traveler interact with that then, if it is the most diverse city, if this is a, a city of, uh, where refugees are welcomed before they go on to green card and then US citizenship, how can we interact with that? And that's a really important factor of places to love is that um, it's not a docu, it's not a documentary about places. This is um, a, a real uh, call to action to travel. So I would say 95% of everything I do, you can do. 90% uh, of the people I meet you will be able to meet. It is so important to me that you don't see me as having these VIP experiences that look great on camera, but you will never have access to. Um, this really is about showing you what you can do. So that's why we chose Houston. And Houston also, uh, we shot Houston when Kevin, uh, spring of 2017, I think it was late April. Uh, yeah, no, early April, early April, right, early April. And so we shot Houston, had an amazing time, loved the people there. And then in the fall, Harvey hit the devastating hurricane. And um, we saw just devastating images come out of Houston and then Houston Strong came out. And um, during that time, we just thought, uh, we had to decide what would be our very first episode for Places to Love. And now mind you, most people of course, um, wonderfully so know me from the Travel Channel for my at least 10 to 15 years there. And um, and I think I'm really known for like going to Europe and seeing the greatest hits and going to Disney World and all these really well-known big name places. And so I, um, I really wanted to show Houston as our first episode because one, it had come out of so uh, much hardship to show that, you know, the Phoenix was rising but also to really usher in, hopefully, how you would see sort of the next stage of my career as a traveler, which is um, uh, someone who um, really wants to have a more personal interaction with their travels. Um, they really want to get to know the people of the place that they're visiting. And that's my biggest lesson I have learned in my hosting of shows for the last 20 years is that um, it, it's about the people and it's how you interact with them and what you can learn from people who have seemingly very different lives from us. But um, in the end, we're, we're really all the same and that we love, we, we want the best for our family, we have passions and, um, and we give a tremendous amount of effort to succeed in this world. And so the point of Places to Love is to really show those success points where you can be a part of, you can interact with the locals in a way that continues that success. And so then you feel less of a, of a consumer and more a part of the community, right? We are, we're all a part of a big community. So um, Houston, Texas was our very first episode. It wasn't the very, very first, Kevin, right? I mean, I guess we should talk about that. So it was number one as the official episode we shot as a series, but to prove that we could be on public television, we had to do a proof of concept, which was an actual episode and that was Brooklyn, New York. So Brooklyn, New York is I mean, I guess technically our very, very first episode, and yet because Slight, it was slightly different crew concept, as well during that time. Slightly different know. crew, right? So 
we did the proof of concept, we sent it to public television, they give us the green light, and now we have the green light from public television, which allows us now to go get funding. And so this was a, probably a two year process, right? Wouldn't you say, uh, at least, just um, from thinking this is something we could do, have our own travel show, um, how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna raise money? How, how does any of this happen? And I, I mean, I tell you, like every day we learn something new. There is no trajectory that you learn about. You do A, B, C, D, E. We, we knew none of that. We just, you know, just kind of like jumped off the cliff and built our wings on the way down. And um, so we had the proof of concept, then Brooklyn, what were we gonna say, okay? Well, I was gonna say, before we get into like the real guts of the episode and start a little housekeeping, our buddy Daniel, Ask the question. Okay. Oh, hold up. You're not in the same room. No, Daniel. Mommy and daddy have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Sam's on a sambatical. Okay. <laughs> uh, she's at her place Great. in Hudson Valley. I'm with the kids in Brooklyn, and she's uh, plotting our future and having a, a, I, uh, no bothering of her to do, to do so. And we... Uh, figured out we could do this kind of remotely and it's kind of cool but it's a it's a new thing yeah the remoteness yeah it is it is and i wish i you know so this root behind me kind of see the fruit in the background on the mantle i know a lot of people get excited about how fruit i have Should i, I turn only the light have... on from here do you want me to do that yeah you can turn the light on that's how cool kevin is he's so remote you can turn lights on um from different parts of, of the world um but uh yeah, so we're in different houses and um, aren't we lucky? We, we are so uh, lucky. We bought this farmhouse that I'm in, gosh, what, 12 years ago yeah. as an escape from New York. And it's been a, a lifesaver, really. Uh, but Kevin's back in Brooklyn. I'm here being creative because one thing I couldn't be is creative when I was being interrupted every 20 minutes. So uh, this, again, is yeah, the sabbatical. I like that. Yeah. I like that, Kevin. Did you um, get the lights and, on? No. And the second thing, housekeeping wise, we got a little issue of drinky poos. Oh, so, Kevin has um, his margarita. Who knew margaritas? Out, uh, you know, we sent out a post earlier with um, our good friends at uh, Hugo Ortega's restaurants, uh, Sochi, and you know, he's got a bunch of restaurants in Houston. Sent us some of their official cocktail list. This is out of focus. There you go. This is a peach paloma, and it's very nice. I might have had one earlier testing, you know, for research. Wow. Wow, I, I don't cook and I'm not a mixologist as well. And so when I saw those ingredients come in, Kevin, I just decided to pour myself a glass of rosé, which I thought was still in keeping with the theme of the show. I just call it the uh, uh, the pink rosé of Texas. Get it? Now the yellow rose. And I'm also wearing my Super Bowl 51 shirt, which was in Houston. It was a fun, fun weekend. Nice. A little fun fact. I scouted our Houston episode the Monday after the Super Bowl. I was very lucky I got uh, one tickets in an auction, my first and only Super Bowl experience, which was amazing. But since I was there, we did a show. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, so let's start Houston and- Let's do it. And there's a, what? Let's do it. Yeah. Oh, and, and just a little different from the creativity because we're controlling this. What we can do is stop scenes, um, you know, move through and back and forth and kind of talk to you about, okay, what we were thinking here. And so it's kind of fun being at an earlier time, but also having this added device where instead of streaming along a live uh, little broadcast of the show, we can kind of go back and forth. Um, so let's start Houston, Texas. Stand by. Well, I think this was uh, a long time ago. So now we're talking about the the, um, the actual flood. Travelers are always on the lookout for the little-known haunts and hidden gems. But what if that hidden gem was an entire city? A city that has evolved into having one of the most ethnically diverse populations in the United States. And with great diversity comes great change. And that's a change you can taste, a change you can see, and a change you can hear. A hidden gem that's Texas-sized, this is Houston. I'm Samantha Brown, and I've traveled all over this You can go through this, Kevin, right? We don't need to stay with this. Destinations, places. Uh, sure. 
<laughs> we still have our sponsors, though. I'm a Waterways. We do still have our sponsors. One. Yep, season one, I'm a Waterways. This is what I was talking about. We got a proof of concept, and then we started talking to these wonderful organizations and saying, hey, we have this crazy idea. It's not so crazy because we think we can do it to really show the integrity and the stories behind travel. And would you be a part of this? And it's no small amount that they they give us, and but it allows us to travel to 13 destinations every year, both international and domestic. And uh, RV, Go RVing was uh, one of the first to sign on and say, yeah, this is great. The city named after Sam Houston has an unexpectedly vibrant museum culture. The museum district includes 19 of them within a mile and a half radius. You can easily walk to most of them. They range from the expansive and renowned Museum of Fine Arts to the peaceful and meditative Rothko Chapel, to activist art that speaks of a community-wide effort like Project Row Houses. Houston is indeed a city of art, and nowhere is that more evident than in its local, homegrown scene. I'm Gonzo 2 for 7 I'm a mural artist, and here we are. I guess you could say that graffiti was my gateway drug to the arts. I got into graffiti art as a kid, and then that led me to pop art. Pop art led me to surrealism, surrealism led me to Dada, and so on, so on, so. If it wasn't for graffiti uh, really kind of taking me in, I don't think I would have ever done what I'm doing today. Hey, Kev, can you stop? Gonzo 247 gives... Or actually, um, yeah, keep keep it rolling, but I'll, I'll talk over Mural it. How about art that? Tours of Good. So for us, one of the big unexpected gems of Houston, Texas, is, it, is its art scene. It has 17 museums and it has the Holocaust Museum and contemporary and fine art and then just the Museum of Art and, um, and activist art. And so the big question was, actually you can stop it, Kev. Uh, the big question was like, how do we show the art? Do we go to a museum? And do we do, we do the, the Project Row Houses? How do we, we can't do it all. And that's one of the, the biggest challenges of doing any travel series. We can't show it all. And what I wanted to get away from, which I had in the past been a part of shows that were just so fast. You know, it was just like each scene was like one minute and we would move on. I wanted to spend more time. I wanted to spend more time with the, the art of the conversation and getting to know the people and who they really were. So we just thought perfectly, um, uh, Gonzo 247 just uh, encompassed just the arts in Houston, that it was the local art scene that people were most proud of because they had been brought up as Houstonites, um, uh, uh, Houstonians, um, uh, in this amazing, uh, with this amazing infrastructure of art that it could trickle all the way down to what they were most proud of were their local artists. And we meet Gonzo 247 and he gives this amazing analogy of why beer and craft beer and graffiti arts go hand in hand in any city. Take a look. I hope you get all the free beer you can drink when you, you know, come here. Uh, well, well, first of all, I mean, it's Texas' oldest craft brewery. It's located here in Houston, and it's one of the best things about Houston. It really gives literally Houston that flavor. Mm -hmm. It worked really well hand in hand because you can compare the street art culture and the craft beer culture, and, and they're basically, they, they live the same history of craft beer when it first started in America here, it was something a few people were doing that no one really understood. They're like, why would I pay more money for a beer when I can just buy this cheap stuff? Or mm -hmm. people didn't understand the flavor of it or, or why you put so much work into it. And, and little by little, the craft beer scene really started taking over, uh, especially here in Houston. And, and now people, they love it. They want it. It's in demand. And now breweries like this can really help just promote the craft beer. Well, same thing with street art. Street art was misunderstood. No one really knew what to do with it. And little by little, not only is, is it no longer feared, it's in demand. People want it. And, and so this was a, a great kind of connection. It's a great crossing of the roads between two subcultures. Yeah. And now we have art wrapping art, right? So it's art inside <laughs> of art. And so you can turn um, down I've the been volume really a little Brock, uh, has, he's, he's a great patron of the arts here in the city. Right. And Brock owns. We're just about to meet Brock Wagner, who owns the brewery, who's the master brewer. But did you notice uh, Gonzo's necklace, what that was? It's all the little uh, spray caps of his spray bottles. He saves every single one and he makes art out of them. And what we missed at the beginning of the scene is it's his art wrapping the beer and his art is mural art is shown when you walk in. And then he makes that analogy of why that's important with the mural artists and the craft beer scene. They kind of come up together when a city is making a statement, when a city is saying, 
uh, not only are we uh, a city of this world, we are a city of the locals and we support our locals. So yeah, see his necklace, isn't that, isn't that awesome? <laughs> I love his necklace. Um, and so now we're about to meet Brock and I'll show you one of the challenges of shooting a scene like this. It's really easy when it's back and forth. It's me and another person, me and Gonzo. Okay, now let's add Brock and see what happens. And good beer. Yeah, and what I love about this is you can come to St. Arnold's and get the best of both worlds because you can have great beer and check out all the art. Mm -hmm. So you have the oldest craft brewery in Texas. Yes. How old is it? Uh, gonna be 23 years now. We weren't the first craft brewery. We were so, the oldest. And you can keep going at, and if you just bring the volume down. This word. Um, Brock, we didn't realize, is like nine feet tall. So, and I'm like, I'm five foot three. Gonzo's taller than me. So as a cameraman, if I could just speak for Brian, our DP, like shooting a scene with different heights is really hard. And we have two cameras, but one camera is always on me and and me and like a three shot. And then we just, we just didn't have enough cameras as it were. And so it's, it, becomes a little awkward and what we don't want it to be is awkward we want there to be a pleasant conversation that flows from being in a natural so that's just kind of behind the scenes that kind of that that, that tripped us up for like i don't know 25 minutes like how are we going to shoot this scene but brock owns an art car and i don't know if people know what this is i had no idea i was drinking art car ipa gonzo had made the label for the beer and i was like what's an art car and they're like what's an art car and this is an absolute subculture in Houston, Texas. And what's amazing about his his art car is it's hops, barley, yeast, and then fire. It's all the elements that make great beer spray painted or painted on. But the art car scene in Houston, they have an art car parade. They all have an art car museum. People love their cars. And the reason why is Houston is massive, right? It's this sprawling city. It's, it's you know, you, you go an hour and a half just to go a few miles because of traffic. So people love their cars and their cars become political statements. Their cars become art statements. Um, it's, it's a creative way of being in your car. And they said it just kind of spreads joy. Everybody smile. It is the best source of smiles. <laughs> As if on cue. <laughs> Rock, is this where we're saying goodbye? Thank this you for the it. ride. All right, brother. Absolutely, I enjoyed it. How do we get out of this car? <laughs> yeah, and these stairs. Dude. Oh my god, you don't even want to be on it. Gonzo has taken me to Graffiti Park, sort of an open air gallery that showcases the surge of street art that you can see all over Houston. So this is one of my Houston tribute pieces that I painted. This is yours. This is mine. Yeah, this is mine. I love it. Bright and colorful. <laughs> is that your style, bright and colorful? You know, I was once asked, what's your palette? And I just said bright. Right. You know, I, I think I'm and a colorful person to begin with. Uh -huh. and so as as Gunther talking about his like... painting, you walk into the shot, and there's the DP, our Brian, uh, our DP. And we know where to stop because we have a mark. Right, so we just don't know, we just don't spontaneously ran, you know, uh, kind of arrive at a place and then Brian, our cameraman has to fix. Brian's fixed on a scene, we walk into it and we have a mark that we're hitting. So it's very, um, in that sense, it can be staged just so we get the best shot. And our mark at that point was an uh, was a discarded cigarette, just so you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a, we have a, a huge budget. For places uh, to love, but to find... so that, that my positive energy, I guess. What does the mural arts do for Houston? I think for me, it's it, important, it, right? I mean, uh, it's... Definitely, definitely. You know, Houston can't say that it competes with any other major city uh, in the world if it doesn't accept or doesn't really show and promote and showcase the local artists. I think it's really cool that Houston has a space like this where where mm -hmm. the community is invited to come in. It's very safe. When I was a kid, there was one mural in my neighborhood, and that mm -hmm. was it. And that mural really impressed me. It really it had an impression on me and it really inspired me to, to become an artist. So I figured if one mural did that for me, what would 100 murals do for another kid? Right, and, and, and now they have this whole and now we area have this to area. come to. I mean, Let's this go is, check it out. This is incredible. Awesome. So is all the art here, is it done by Houston artists, local artists? No, actually, uh, we pride ourselves on having so a, a, a good international uh, the, feel. The Graffiti Park is actually uh, international artists from around the world can come here and paint. And and um, coming from a travel show perspective, our point of view, once we spent a good, I think, five minutes on the scene discussing mural arts and how it interacts with the with the with the city, 
we now know as a travel show that we really can't show mural arts for a long time. Uh, so it takes it, it sort of takes it out of a place now So because Houston owned the mural arts. And this is um, difficult as we go to other cities and like, oh my gosh, we have amazing mural art. And like, ha, ah, we kind of did that in Houston. And just to really hit that point harder, the next time, if you could stop it, Kevin, the next time we did the mural arts was our very last episode of season three. So we did it our very first episode of season one, the mural arts. And we didn't do it again until the last episode of season three in Miami, where we did Windwood Walls. So once we really cover um, a, a subject in, in, in a very full, full way, um, we don't really go back to it, except when it comes for beer to beer. <laughs> beer we did like five times in season one, but we always tried to approach it from a different way. So this time we did a brewery with Brock. We really focused on how it um, the beer really actually supports the, the arts industry of Houston. And then the next time we did beer, say in Huntsville, Alabama, we approached it from the scientists and how beer was buying beer and kind of craft brewery, the laws prohibited it. So um, so whenever we do a subject, we're very aware if we've already done it a few times and we try to take it sort of out of rotation. <laughs> um, so uh, that's, that's that. Um, this is a very important scene to me. I think it's one of the, my most important scenes of my life because um, I'm about to go to the Phoenicia, which is a supermarket in Houston. And this is one of those scenes, as a traveler, one of my biggest tips was whenever you are, especially like in Europe, um, go to the supermarkets. So, and, and how I, well, I would go to the supermarkets because that's how I would learn a language. Because the, the supermarket, if you go up the canned goods, the labels, you can see what they are. They're just like little like language flashcards, right? You know, if you're in France and it says, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, la poise, it would be peas. You're like, okay, I see la poise. And so I would go to supermarkets just to kind of look at the food and the labels. And, um, and then I would know what they were on the menu. This, I mean, this is before there were apps people, so don't make fun of me. And still to this day, I rarely um, advise an app for language. I just either be, I'm polite, I know a few phrases, or I wing it. But I feel it's really odd to like look at a phone the entire time and be like, wait a minute, I know what I'm going to say. Hold on, hold on. So um, I would learn to a language. I thought going to a supermarket was the best way. I also love to pick up goods that I could bring home um, to my family. Um, I, I bought the best things like in Greece, um, Hellman's mayonnaise actually makes mustard and the mustard comes packaged in a little um, juice wine stem glass. It, 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 it's Hellman's and it's mustard. And so every time you buy, a, 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 it's not a jar, you buy a stem glass of mustard. So you have a nice little little uh, glass to knock back some, I don't know, ouzo <laughs> um, when you're done. Um, in, in, I remember I was in Argentina, no, Spain, and I brought uh, Captain Cronchero because I just thought that was funny. So I love supermarkets and I spent a lot of time in supermarkets. And this is a scene that I would never be able to do on a Travel Channel show. I think they would just look at me and laugh. But a supermarket has been just where I have loved to be. Okay, roll, roll the scene, Deb. Food. I can't take that back home, and I want to load up my suitcase with products I've never seen before. Oh. Now, I know I'm not abroad. I'm here in the United States. But when I found out about this supermarket, I thought, oh, I'm going to need a bigger suitcase. How many items do you have here? Over 15,000. From how many countries? I'm trying to keep the countries in my head, how many I, I, I see in terms of the able, labels. I don't think you're going to be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, over 50. Over 50? Yeah. Are most of the countries from the Middle East? From all over Europe, Eastern Europe, Russia, South America, Asia, Mediterranean. So we have a little bit of everything. How old is this market? Uh, we opened this market in 2006. Okay. Originally it was across the street and that had opened in 92. But the grandfather of them all was a sandwich shop that my parents started in 83 across the street. In 83, so it all started with a sandwich shop yeah. in 1983. With a few grocery shelves in it. Yeah. And now, this is incredible. Is there one food group a great that back all story 50 countries enjoy? That I'm there with uh, Arpi and Zorabs, and you can keep playing it, Kevin. Is there one Zorab's son, you bring down the volume, um, Zorab's son, Hike. And if you look at him, Notice how tired he is. You can see the bags under his eyes. He had had a uh, just had a new baby girl, I believe, 
two weeks before he did the scene and he was exhausted. And I just, that I've always found that so endearing that he was just beat from having um, a, a new baby in the house. I'll get you a sample. I thought that hint was pretty good. <laughs> Can we have a sample? It's a little this, traveler's this tip. When cheese. you really want to try something, you just say, oh, I've never seen or tasted that before. And then you get whatever you want. In a cup. Yeah. And that really works. That's great. I assure you. I, I'll give you a spoon, but I could just a finger, finger is finger. probably going to be easier. Mm. That's great. So right here, this has to be the main event. It is. I I've it never is. seen anything like this. <laughs> we call it the Willy Wonka of pita bread. <laughs> yes. It's hot. Yeah. Let me get you a sample. Let yeah. me get you one. Can we, can we walk in? Yes. I'll take this one. Whoa, right off the presses. <gasps> it's a warm pillow. Look at that. I've, I've never had pita like this. This is beautiful. Usually I have pita that comes in that package of like three and it's yeah. been in the supermarket for about a year and a half. I think this is slightly better than that. How much pita comes down these conveyor belts? Oh my Every goodness. Day? Probably around 15,000 loaves. 15,000 of these coming down. And so why did you have this conveyor belt constructed? Well, is this out of necessity or is it just really fun to see? It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It's actually my father's idea. A lot of places you go to that have this kind of machines around well, the world we do have a go tucked through away in the back room. Proving that GoPros can yep, go through a, a hot oven and still make it out on the other side. We didn't know. We, we, we put the GoPro in, we're like, I hope it comes out the other end. But now we're about to meet Hike's parents, Arpi and Zorab. Oh, um, play just, a, and just, um, I, I have so much love for these two. It was an amazing story. We talk a little bit about it here, but um, play a little bit of the story and then I'll elaborate. And Kevin. when she's calling me mama, <laughs> mama, they are putting from the top. I don't know if it's going to fall down. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. And now even tourists, they come of and course. see all around and watch the bread, how it's got, uh, coming down. Everybody knows Arpi at the Phoenicia. You'll usually find her behind the counter at Arpi's Deli right next door. And Zora has a long history in the food business. That's him at his father's store in his native home of Lebanon, a country that was, at the time, much too volatile to raise a family. We came 78, 1978. 1978. The worst days of the Lebanon, the war, civil war. And all of a sudden, surprise, I got uh, pregnant. pregnant. I came in. So <laughs> you're the reason. It was almost it was a, you. It was him. All of this is because yes. of you. Yes. Good he, job. he brought charm and luck to us, uh. to the family. So she had a cousin here. We decided to come here temporarily a few months and right here, go this. back. <laughs> you heard this story, how um, they told it to you first, where they're in Lebanon. The Lebanon Civil War breaks out in uh, the early 70s, I believe. And Zorab is an engineer and he has a green card. And he comes to Texas all the time to help design and engineer big buildings, the, really the building of Texas. And as um, uh, they love their home, they wanna stay in Lebanon, but the war is getting too intense and too dangerous. And the very last week that Zorab's green card was valid, he packed up the entire family. Hike has two other siblings, a, a brother and a sister, got him in the car and got to the airport, left the keys in the car and just boarded the plane to the United States and got here. And I just, that's just one of those amazing American immigrant stories of coming here and, and fulfilling the American dream. And they weren't, they were, they were, escaping from a war, but they had very good lives. And the idea that they got here when they did and what they went on to be and who they are to the Houston community, to me just speaks volumes of these people and, and, and who they are. And I will say, I, I'm starting a petition. Um, I, I would like to be adopted into the Chilakian family. I feel like I have reached out to you many times. Wait, is this uh, what the all about? I, <laughs> I love my family. I love your family, Kevin. I love my mom and dad. I feel like like you can have dual citizenship in some countries. I could have a dual family 
family ship. And so I'm just reaching out to the Chilakians right now. I would like to be adopted. Okay, uh, continue with the scene. To be here while the, the while the war was going on. Yes. We missed Lebanon. I would imagine. We had very good life. I used to work in American University Hospital as a laboratory technician. He, had, he used to build buildings. So, so you, we you had, had careers? Yes, yes. From back home, my family, which was against, you are separating our family while you are leaving us. They are calling, they are saying, stay where you are. Stay in Don't stay in come. What, what is that? Uh, it, like? it, 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 it was very difficult at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But we, we are tough, we are strong, we handled it right. So we are proud to live in wisdom. We feel like home. So that's all I can say. That's beautiful. And now you feel like you're home. And if you're watching this scene, for those of you who are interested in the dynamics of a scene and how we, uh, where we put the cameras, when we do a scene, we do kind of a master, a master conversation. And uh, Kevin, you chime in. I think, so Brian is usually, I have a camera all to myself. And, and then the other three share the other two cameras and the other camera, uh, that's their angle. And um, what I love about that scene is just as our second camera angle was uh, really focusing on RP, she said her beautiful words, we were tough, we were strong, we handled it right. And there are times where we might not have gotten that, right? It, there's, there's so many times where you just wish you could have it, you know, four more cameras kind of covering it so you get all those nuances because um, uh, for this show, the conversation and really understanding the heart and the emotional um, uh, uh, through line of people and their effort and their businesses is so, so important that we want to be there for those moments. And we, um, in terms of scheduling this, say this scene, we, we, probably, um, we probably made this a four hour scene. We, we, you know, in our, our schedule, it was four hours so we could get everything we needed to so that I could spend time having tea with Zorab and RP because you can imagine I just show up. I've got two cameras. I've got a sound engineer. I've got my stylist. I've got my producer, my director. Like we really can change the energy and all of a sudden people kind of tense up and it's my role as the host uh, quite literally to, to make them feel at ease. That's my job. And um, and to do that, I need time. I need a more conversation. I need to spend time with them. And, and we put all of that on camera and that this was towards the end of the conversation. I could tell RP was, she was relaxed that they're in the middle of their supermarket where they're busy. They've got jobs. They've got a, they've got a shelf unit. She's got her own deli. She's running. She's, they're distracted. But all of a sudden in this one moment, because we spent time and we really wanted her and, and Zorab and Hype to feel like their story was important, the story comes out. And that is so important to the, the filming of the show is to give scenes time to blossom because that, that would not happen in the first half hour of being there. It might not even happen in the first hour. It's the fact that we showed who we were as a professional crew we value your story and those those moments happen. So um, it's th these aren't happenstance moments. We work very hard to try to create the environment that creates those moments that you can see on camera. Yeah, and I think the crew does a, a really good job of kind of insulating Samantha from the kind of technical stuff about, hey, should we have that light on or what do we, should the table be over here or True. there? So that, so that you can have those moments and those conversations and get, okay. get to know the people. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we don't have uh, two weeks to do a show where you can spend a day just chatting and getting to know them. And then the next day come in and film. It's, it's, we show up and, you know, as, you know, as the person that pays the bills here, the as soon as we can get in and out, the better for our budget. But we really try to spend a lot of time there to make sure we get it right. And we have time to let the, let the conversation breathe. And, you know, there's some magic there that, that you, you really, bring out of people and th there's a there's an art to that but i think you know our crew is really diligent trying to keep you focused so that you can have those kind of pre-conversations and then be you know able to have it on camera as well 
Yeah, absolutely. There, there's no rushing. And, and that's the beauty of working with my cameraman for so many years, Brian, who I've worked with for 15. I'll start a conversation with people and he'll be setting up and literally I'll just give him a look and he'll know, start rolling. So the person that I'm talking to, who knows they're going to be on camera at some point, this is what this is all about, but they don't know that we've been rolling for the probably the last 10 minutes. And then we get into a, um, I, it's, I always know when someone's a little tense, okay, we need to kind of um, put them at ease and now just kind of start the, start the camera and they don't even know. And then all of a sudden we're into it. So there's a few things that we're, as a crew, that's their, they're my team. We, we just look at each other and, and we know, okay, now let's begin. And so, um, but uh, you know, Zorab and RP, my, my parents, um, I'm so proud of them. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really get much better than that. It's just a no, no, it doesn't, it doesn't everything get everything about it is perfect. Yeah. perfect. Yeah. Nisha yeah. is a tangible symbol of just how incredibly diverse the city of Houston has become. And now I've come to visit one of the city's most inspiring endeavors. My name is Roxanne Paiva, and I am co founder of the Community Cloth. We are a micro enterprise initiative to empower refugee women right here in Houston, Texas. These are refugees, yes. which is different from an immigrant. Very much so. Very yep. much so. Yep. They, they, they've left countries that were war-torn, right. civil war, religious persecution, and now they have asylum here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Easier said than done, right? Yeah. Okay, you're here, you're in the land of opportunity. Uh, now what? Yes. Right? You, you've lost your country. Yeah. You've lost uh, maybe some family members. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you've lost your identity. Mm -hmm. Here you are. There are thousands of these refugees, these families that are incredible. They live down the street, mm -hmm. and so I just jumped in and started volunteering. Is that when Community Cloth was born? You thought, okay, we've, we've got this group of women, they're, they're weavers? They weave, they knit, they crochet, they make jewelry. <laughs> By volunteering within the community, we identified that they had this skill set, and we brought them together in a community meeting. Mm -hmm. So the women were at the planning table. They were right there. Telling us what they wanted and what they needed. That's how we created the community cloth. The difficult part is the zipper. Yeah. I hate the zipper. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's very much about friends. It's very um, much about getting out of their apartment complex mm -hmm. and getting into the community. Hello. Is this yours? We invest in the economic capital. The artisans are able to sell their products, sometimes for the first time in their lives. What does that do for their, their sense of place and their sense of self? When uh, they're actually making something and someone wants to buy it. Yeah, I mean, think about that. That's something that, you know, if you knit something by your hands or you weave something with your own two hands and seeing somebody coming up and purchasing it and putting it on and wearing it with pride. I mean, that's a big deal. I feel like... This changes the trajectory of the lives of the women, but also their families, mm -hmm. their kids, their husbands, their friends are seeing them making something from scratch and then selling it. My name is Khatra. Khatra? Mm -hmm. Khatra? Where are you from? I'm from Afghanistan. Afghanistan, my goodness. I wish Afghanistan became safe and you can go there. Me too. Me too. <laughs> I would love to go there. Yes. So when we said that, it, uh, when you move from Afghanistan, it, the, the idea that Houston is the number one, uh, the main refugee city here in the United States, and how do we interact with that? And when we found Community Cloth, um, and we work with a lot of people to find these. I think people ask, how do you find these hidden gems? We work with the tourism. Their, their tourism office was phenomenal. And they really ate, were able to fill in the gaps that we couldn't find, not being boots on the ground. And uh, Community Cloth is still going strong. Um, it's online, so you can communitycloth.org. Good topic, Kev. Um, but, and, and actually back it up to Hatra. Um, but uh, communitycloth.org online, where you can buy a lot of these products because of, of COVID, they're not getting together and having um, these uh, sort of pop-up shops, uh, but they are, the women are still making goods. And this is Hathra, and where we meet her, she is a refugee from Afghanistan. And uh, so she was a legal uh, refugee, and she was working to get her green card, um, which uh, I think a year ago, uh, uh, she received her green card, and now she is studying to be a nurse on her way to US citizenship. So it was a wonderful story. And again, just where Houston really shines as this place where people come to uh, forge a different life, a new life, a better life, and make the world 
a better place. So Community Cloth was just one of those phenomenal organizations and, and, and you can support them right now if you went online to their to their website and uh, we can continue. And now we're gonna get to the, the food portion, which I think everyone loves, especially in Houston. Um, the food portion. Nothing says the hype of a city is just yeah. more than its food theme. The food theme hey, is that a peach paloma they're making there? I don't know. This city's multicultural I think we have a cameo by our friend Paula. Any second? Oh, maybe I missed it. What is great about being a chef is to express my um, knowledge about the Mexican cuisine, my memories, uh, and most of all, the bounty of what Mexico uh, has to offer. Hugo Ortega came to the United States from his native Mexico at the age of 17 and literally worked his way up the food chain, from dishwasher to food prep, from line cook to internationally renowned chef. You've been okay. nominated for a James Beard Award how many times? Half a dozen. Half a dozen. <laughs> Congratulations. It's very expensive to go to Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> and then the tuxedo that I fit uh, six years ago, I don't fit anymore, so we have to spend on a new tuxedo. <laughs> really expensive. So last year, you got a new tuxedo. So you're ready for this year, right? So I'm ready for this year. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Four weeks later, Chef Hugo Ortega won the James Beard Award for Best Chef Southwest. Boy, did we here, Kevin, and we were like, yeah, we were so excited. Um, but if you continue rolling the scene, okay. I, I would like to he talk to you about Tracy um, own four restaurants. Um, he and his wife Tracy now own four restaurants, and and Hugo came over the border, I believe, in the back in the trunk of a car at 17 years old, and he worked his way up from a dishwasher up to owning four restaurants. Under the Reagan years, uh, when Reagan granted amnesty, he took advantage of that and he became a U.S. citizen. So again, just the best people we could possibly have in this country that work hard and that understand they can bring their own sense of culture to ours and, and make us a richer country for it. Uh, but let's listen to some of his, um, is the king of the sauces. It, it is in many ways. It's a very difficult sauce to make, way. right? This particular uh, mole have 21 ingredients. 21 ingredients, and is it chocolate? Is chocolate one of the Chocolate ingredients? is the last ingredient to enrich and give give character. How? long does it take? About three days from start to finish. But, you know, once you, you master the way of making this sauce, it's, um, okay, it's, right it's, there. A, it's part of your Back DNA. It well, you see that big mouthful I took? Just play that again. Um, <laughs> thanks, Kevin. I about three days one. from start to finish. Um, but, you know, once you, you master the way of making this. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, stop right there. Um, uh, shooting a food scene is like my nemesis. It's so hard. It is so hard to carry on an intelligent conversation while you have food in front of you. Here's the chef. You want to ask intelligent questions, yet you want to keep eating or it just becomes this like dead interview. So I'm always conscious of the fact of keeping things moving, being dynamic. I'm drinking, I'm eating, I'm, I'm talking. And, um, and it's just, it's harder than it looks. So, um, also as a film crew, we've got to position our cameras. So we see a busy restaurant, but we don't see that the table that was in back of us has now left and now there's nobody there. So for editing purposes, we have had to um, edit a ton of shots out that were great shots because it totally changed that that table now moved. Um, a person joined them and you can see it's, it's really obvious. So these dynamics of, of of setting up the shot are really hard. And as a crew, we kind of come in, especially to a restaurant like Sochi, which is quite large. We know we want to get the, the kitchen. We want to show that in action. I wanted to be back in the kitchen. That's a whole nother element. Then we want to be in the restaurant showing a busy bustling restaurant and waiters coming back and forth. And um, uh, so it's not just this kind of flat surface of me alone in a restaurant with the chef. Um, and, um, and it's just really it's 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 just difficult to orchestrate. So there's a lot of uh, of moving parts, and um, and uh, 
And and sometimes I take a, a my gosh, that was like the biggest bite of ever. Every time I see this episode, I'm like, my gosh, was I? <laughs> did, did no one feed me that day? <laughs> you know, it's it's a common thing we have whenever we and we we feed, we always, we go to a restaurant almost every episode. And the question is, well, when yeah, should we be there? Do we be there? Are yeah, we there during lunch there. rush or dinner rush, where the cameras are being bumped into by people and we're bothering people with their cameras. Yep. Are we there when the place is closed and it looks really dead and has no energy? It's always it's always a struggle. Yeah. A place like Sochi solved that for us because it's busy all day. <laughs> yep. So, you know, yep. we had no choice and it worked. It was fine. Um, but, you know, it's just that's not a, a restaurant that would close and have a, you know, like an empty time during between lunch and dinner. But, you know, it's always a concern we have about when to film in a restaurant and make it seem like a yeah. you know, good place. Yeah. So it's, because they're they're. It's, is always busy and they're always yeah but you want to show that but you don't want to get in the way and and then on top of that we can't show people for a, uh, i mean everyone walking into there if if anyone was walking into sochi while we were filming they were met with a big disclaimer that says walking into this room means you agree to have your image on television and basically you agree if you don't you can't come in right now because we can't just film people that uh, that's uh a, a live a broadcast rule. We have to have signatures of everyone. We have to uh, respect their privacy and have to make them very aware of of um, what you know what we're doing. In fact, just as a little uh, side note, when people say, "Hey, what are you shooting for?" I always say, "America's Most Wanted." <laughs> <laughs> I think I've been saying that for twenty years, and it just um, never gets old. Is is it is part of your DNA? <laughs> <laughs> and my grandmother was born in Oaxaca, and uh, I had the great opportunity to live with her uh, for six years, from uh, seven to 12, 13. So it was your grandmother who gave you uh, the passion and also the discipline to be who you are right now. My grandmother was my mentor. You know, she uh, gave me so much structure in my life at a young age. And uh, she has so much discipline, so much to learn when you uh, have the opportunity to live with your grandmother, right? Mm -hmm. And your grandmother have a, a way to dance with life, you know? Very obvious that you have a very strong affection for Mexico. Oh, yes, indeed. Do you also feel like you have a responsibility to it? To me, life is about discipline and responsibility. Yes, it is. You got to be responsible. In this case, for the wonderful people, they are my co-workers, the wonderful people of this city, the entire state, and the entire country. I carry that responsibility in my shoulders. And from time to time, I feel that responsibility a square sitting in my shoulders. <laughs> you feel that weight. And uh, my responsibility is about making people uh, create memories and make them feel happy about coming to Sochi. Let's just stop right there because he, he personally said, you know, uh, back it up, Kev. Um, any any person who says grandmothers have a different way of dancing in life. Oh my gosh! I mean, isn't that true? We all we all rely on. I know I rely on my mom, who is is a grandmother, and just the way she sees things. I just loved when he said that, and that's what we're going for. We're going for the heart and soul. We're where we're trying to create experiences where they reveal a little bit more about themselves to a camera as it's faced directly in them and they're busy. And and I just, I, I love that moment. Now we're about to get into the end of the show, which is The Suffers with Cam Franklin as the lead singer. And oh my gosh, there, Kevin, there's so much to talk about here. Um, where to begin? Um, why don't you play a little so we understand who Cam Franklin and The Suffers are. And now, for a little night music and a little night cap, I head to a Texas music institution, the Continental Club. I'm Cam Franklin, and I'm the lead singer for The Suffers. You weren't always a part of The Suffers. No. So the band, the band started in 2011. It was supposed to just be this weekend 
fun kind of thing. This was a hobby. I mean, way to venture I, yeah, creative I worked, energy. I worked at the investment bank. We had teachers in the band. My guitar player worked at NASA as a uh, consumables engineer for the International Space Station. This wasn't. This wasn't supposed to be what it is. You had good jobs. We had good jobs. Yes. And then you all okay, left yeah. your jobs. So, yes. He, and maybe you can. We, we knew about the suffers. We knew they were a fantastic band, and I forgot how. It came to be, but when they, when we reached out to them and said, would you be in our travel show? Um, and they came back with, yes, right? What, what, what happened there? Because um, getting live music for a show is another, just a, a feat unto itself, right? Uh, you know, get, locking down the musicians, we have to own the rights to their music, which is a whole other thing. We can never just play, and we can't even play four bars of music without having to own it or paying for it in some way. So whenever you do a band on television, oh my gosh, you have to have them sign everything. And like, it's okay to play your music. It's okay to play your music in perpetuity in the show. It's, and, um, but it's live, wonderful music and the Suffers are, are just one of the beloved bands of Houston, if not all of Texas. And and they they said yes, right? Well, well they no. did, but like- So were... when I was scouting, they were out of town. They had just played at the Super Bowl, because every night, the days before the Super Bowl, they have live music. I mean, every, every Super Bowl has that, and they had a big plaza. And they were one of the bands that played. I couldn't get near it, so it was so busy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then they yeah. went off we're on tour and I, I, so I couldn't meet with anyone when I was scouting that. And then by the time we came back to film, they had just come back from a European tour and it was like getting everyone together when they were kind of done was like, right. you know, it was a huge ask for them and they did it. And it was, you know, magic that they did it because it made the episode. And, and this is one thing that we were really lucky to be able to do is that we use their music throughout this whole episode. Um, yes. The, the they, opening they, shot. They, they, yeah, and they allowed that is us to do huge. that. Yes, they allowed the us to do that. episode better, just, just having that like, Holy great music. Yeah, you know, just, they, uh, they yeah. are the sound. They are the sound of, of... But this is where I want to bring in the mastery of our editor, David Dean, because when we shot this scene, of course, I shot the interview first, and then we did sort of the concert at the Continental Club second. And what I did not want to do is this shoot the interview, we, we show the interview on television, and then we go to the, the concert to have that literal, uh, uh, just show that literally. I, I wanted to somehow mesh the interview um, and build it and bring in the music at a good point where we were talking and then go away from the interview and then come back to the music. And and all I, basically in this kind of rambling way that I'm describing to you, I, I talked to my editor, David Dean, and like, this is what I'm thinking, uh, go for it. And, um, he just came back with this scene that, and, and it's just so finely tuned. It's just, for me, it was it's just, uh, a master session of editing, of building that suspense with the music, with what she's saying, and and going back and forth both. It's just storytelling at its best. So uh, I'm gonna stop one more time to talk about one more moment, but let's let's carry it on. Suffers got their first national exposure on The David Letterman Show, blowing everybody away with their signature sound, which they call Gulf Coast Soul. Gulf Coast Soul is a mashup of many different genres brought together that have been influenced by, for us, the city of Houston. Does Houston have a sound? Houston, it's very hard to have one sound. And the reason I say that is because of how culturally diverse it is. I do think that we have one collective energy, which is that we come from a city that has been discredited for so long that we are almost like that that middle kid that's fighting for their parents' attention. Like, you know, we Stop might right not be as seven. clean as down. Stop on me if you go back to me. Uh, the last time you, the camera cuts to me. Yeah, right there. So Cam Franklin is an amazing woman amazing singer and we wanted to do more with her she was going to take us to a korean barbecue place and uh but we just ran out of time and we knew that one she was exhausted they were exhausted they just got back from europe so we're like we're gonna protect your time here and just talk about you and the music and so um here i am talking to cam and 
Well, well, after I tell you this, we'll go back to the just kind of where she starts when I asked, does Houston have a sound? At this moment, she's she's telling me about Houston and she's talking about it in a way that I, as a traveler, would never would never come to understand because I don't live there. And she's explaining it for us. And she's 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 delivering me like I'm as the host, I'm looking at her, but as the writer of the show who's gonna have to go back, who's gonna need to go back and kind of put this all together, I'm realizing the gold that she has just laid at my feet. And right at that moment, my 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 head is just full of tingles. It's just absolutely I'm just alive because I'm like, holy mackerel, I see the end of the show. And and Usually in every travel show I have ever done before, in the 13 series that I did before this, I would end the show. I would write this whole close. It's called The Close. And um, and here Cam is giving me The Close. And I realize at this moment that from now on, this is what this show, Places to Love, will show. The people themselves will tell us what is amazing about their city, their destination. They will themselves close the show but this is the moment that I figured out on episode one that then carried us through for 36 episodes that this was going to make our series really special. And uh, I don't know, maybe if you could bring it back. No, we might not be as clean. All right, you want to go? Go back to, uh, gosh. Right, uh, right there, yeah. Yes. The Suffers got their first national exposure on The David Letterman Show, blowing everybody away with their signature sound, which they call Gulf Coast Soul. Gulf Coast Soul is a mashup of many different genres brought together that have been influenced by, for us, the city of Houston. Does Houston have a sound? Houston, it's very hard to have one sound. And the reason I say that is because of how culturally diverse it is. I do think that we have one collective energy, which is that we come from a city that has been discredited for so long that we are almost like that, that middle kid that's fighting for their parents' attention. Like, you know, we might not be as clean as Dallas and we might not be as laid back as Austin, but, you know, we have a lot to offer and there are so many beautiful people here and artists that have come from so far away to start life here without going broke, without with, with still being able to raise a family and buy a house and stuff like that. But like, I think you can be a, a starving artist in Houston, but still eat good, if that makes any sense. <laughs> People think Houston is flat, swampy, cowboys and oil and gas and good old boys, but Houston is incredible. Houston used to be like this ugly caterpillar that you would see in your garden and not really pay much attention to. Yeah, it's there, whatever, but now Houston has, has, has broken out of the cocoon. It's a beautiful butterfly now. It's, it's, it's flying all over. The, the wings and the colors are really starting to attract eyes and everyone sees Houston on their radar. We don't have the landscape. We don't have the climate, but we have the people and we have the food. <laughs> I think by the end of the day, that is the number one thing that brings people to Houston. Opportunity. When you move to the sound of what it takes to make it, when you share in someone's personal story and achievements, when you can taste years of wisdom and experience, that is when we share a love of travel. And that's why Houston, Texas is a place to love. Yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, you, that, that whole ending from where Cam Franklin and the sufferers just take us home. Basically, they're, they're, we're, he we're horses headed to the barn and they just deliver us. And that is still to the, this day one of the best endings of uh, our entire, uh, all of our seasons, just because the music is there and the passion. And um, I always know we have a good ending when I tear up. And it's not like it is sad, it's just like, it's there, the, the integrity, the passion, 
the beauty of the people. It's there. We did it. We we did we did the right thing. We we we, we got we showed it. We um I don't know. There's 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 just all I know is I need to tear up and then I know, okay, this is the close of the show. We're done. And I think, you know, Houston is still to this day, our first episode, one of my favorites because so much of what we're still trying to do and, you know, and trying to accomplish with the series showing diversity and the beauty of people and, and the effort that it takes to create experiences that, that we as travelers just get to show up and have Houston just put it right up there on a pedestal. And, um, and uh, we thank you. We thank you so much from the bottom of our heart. I will always love, we'll always have Houston, Kevin. Yeah. yeah. One, one thing that, you know, because this was our first episode, we were, we spent more, way more time than any other episode on the edits and just kind of how we wanted to feel because we were creating a blueprint for the season and the series. And that that scene where the towards the end when she's talking about when when she start when she kind of stops talking about music and just talk about Houston, there's a key change mm -hmm. in that song, and at that yeah. moment is when yeah. everything yep. changes to kind of close begin yeah. the close of the show, yeah. and every yeah. time I started tearing up. Every know, time, as, yeah. as the audio levels were being played with or we're going back and forth different cuts i was like wait i'm not tearing up anymore what happened and it was that that key change note had gotten lower in the mix the audio mix and you couldn't hear it as much and it was a real visceral thing for me and yeah i was like yeah. this isn't right like i'm not tearing up anymore i don't know what happened and we put the music back to where it was and it's like yep that's it that's the one yeah yeah, yeah. exactly exactly and look at this look who we have kev uh oh. Did I do it? Hey, Gonzo. Yeah. yeah. Good job. Gonzo. Um, and, and he said, and that's just the tip of the Houston iceberg. We we do. We need to go back to Houston. And 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 our heart hearts are going out to you right now. I know Texas is going through a tough time. And um I just know you you'll be you'll be so strong because you are been and you're a little city and uh and uh, we're just uh, we're just thinking about you, Gonzo. Gonzo was amazing. So we we reached out to Gonzo because we knew he. So the whole thing was he can't. Uh, okay, Gonzo's a mural artist. He's a phenomenal mural artist, but he also gives tours. So if you go online to samantha-brown.com, you'll see how you can connect with Gonzo, so you can do a tour with him. Uh, that you know, the next time you're in Houston, Texas, and that was also really important to us that people again, that whole like docu series this isn't a documentary, these are people you can interact with. You can interact with Gonzo, he's phenomenal and he gives tours. And so, um, he was, uh, I think we had a few conversations, but we basically just said to him, Take us, take us where you want, what's important to you. And and he, um, uh, someone asked me if, if if we plan everything and I, we really, in a way we do and we don't, I certainly know who in the end, who we're going to be with, but we, we make sure that there's space in the form of time for people to show us who they are so we can capture it on, on camera. And when Gonzo, Gonzo just delivered so much in terms of showing us his own murals and his art and his approach to art, and then tying it into the craft brewery scene, just incredible. That's and and there he is. Yes, and that is Gonzo's work right there. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, uh, you know, I think there's been a lot of people who have asked questions and talked on Facebook. You know, we will certainly be going through them if anyone has a question about Houston or the show. Um, you know, someone asked just uh, now about uh, how long we take to plan an episode. And, you know, we we'll go a month or so beforehand for four days or so and kind of see as much as we can meet as many people as we can. And then whoever does, I do most of that, but not all of them. And, and whoever does go out and do that scouting will then kind of put together a kind of a report, present it to the rest of the team. And from that, we'll say, hey, look, you know, that's great, but it doesn't fit if we include this and that it's too much food or something like that. So let's go with this one, not that one. And ultimately we come up with our kind of list of what we're going to feature for the show. And then from there comes a the schedule and then we I'll show up and, and film that, but it's that's usually about a month out before that, and then for a few weeks before mm -hmm. that, we'll be kind of doing research and trying to find people to set up meetings for that scout time. So you know, it's about a month, month and a half beforehand. We're there for four days to film, and then I'd say the editing takes about from beginning to where it's locked down about six weeks. 
Yeah, like yeah. So a, lot, a lot of um, a, a lot of work goes into creating a travel show, and um, and the, the the it's interesting. The whole uh, scouting process was something we never had in the Travel Channel. Um, I know that the producers would maybe go three days ahead of when we arrive quickly, but we made sure that in our show we scouted and then we had time to breathe and kind of really understand where we wanted to go with this. And when we find our people, um, I don't have a certain, um, I, I don't have a, a script or anything. It's just, I want to show them who, for who they are. And then in the editing room, when I start to get the editing back, David Dean will give me string outs. David Dean and I have been working for 15 years. He knows what I love. So he'll just start stringing out great pieces, chunks of great conversation. And I will simply just watch hours upon hours upon hours of the show and literally just watch it for the moment that emotionally I feel a tug and I'm like, okay, that's it, check. That's a good one. And then I just put it aside. Okay, no, nope, nothing there. Okay, check, emotion, good, great. And, um, and so we slowly bring it together and only after we let the people be who they are on camera and really fully so, I connect the dots and understand where the arc of the story is, but I never try to force it. Um, I was a part of television that was so formulaic that I just wanted to get away from that totally. There's no formula. Um, we go in and we give people time and we understand who, try to understand who they are and make sure that they are in a safe place and a, a welcoming place with us to be who they are. And, and the show just delivers itself in, in, in various respects with a lot of help with, with editing and, <laughs> and other things. But um, that's why we just, we love our people. And, and, and Houston, boy, were we spoiled, everybody. Hey, we should talk about the fact that there was one scene cut and David Dean reminded me of this. And it was the at the, um, at the Buffalo Bayou Park, the Bayou, yeah. Buffalo Bayou Park. With the sister. So in their main, in their sort of, sort of central park, their public park, underground is this cistern. And it's amazing. You go underground and it's just these um, pillars. There's like a hundred pillars, right? And it used to be the, the water uh, of, it used to hold the water of Houston, I believe. I'm sorry, this was like an underground storage three area. years ago. What? Yeah. And you should know, we filmed Houston in 2017. Um, and, um, they, of course, it's been empty for a while and they turned it into another art installment. It's fascinating. And there was this incredible artist and I believe she was from somewhere in Europe, but we didn't have the right to show her work. And so when we went in, we saw the, the art installment, which was phenomenal, but we had to turn it off. And so we thought we could still show it and show how cool it was. And I talked to like the city planner underground and how cool the space was. But in the end, um, we could only show, I think maybe like 10 seconds of the artist was all we were allowed, maybe not even that. And again, this is what, this is what comes into the rights. Like as a traveler, you won't, um, you won't interface with any of what we have to interface with in terms of the rights to protect artists. And we, we fully believe if the artist has not signed, uh, you know, what she needs or he needs to, to make sure that it's okay that we film there, that we're not just stealing art. Um, uh, we have to have permission to be everywhere we are. We cannot just show up with our cameras. So we have to do a lot of planning with permits, with permission. Um, and this is why a lot of times what we do uh, can't be as spontaneous as we'd like, because we could show up and people could just say no. And then, and then now we're really in trouble because as my executive producer, who's in charge of signing the checks and paying people, that's a lot of money. Yeah. And once we start shooting, we don't waste a dime. Um, we make sure that everything you, all the money we have shows up on the screen. So um, it takes a tremendous amount of planning and permits and permission. <laughs> oh, wow. Kevin, wow, look at you. So that's the cistern, that's um, so a photograph yeah. of it. So this is the cistern and um, you can't walk within those kind of uh, columns or spires. You can walk around them. And um, and this is where the art light installment was, which was just fantastic. But as you can see, a really cool space. And then it became, how do we like this space? Um, so we shot it, but then in the end, we're like, it just didn't work. It it just didn't work out. It, and it didn't it didn't make the show because because of lighting, because we couldn't really show what it was. And um, so we try to avoid those predicaments because there um, we could use that time for other things. Mm -hmm. 
But as a traveler, you should definitely check it out. Uh, here's a question. Is the order in which we see the episode the order you shoot, or do you put it together after you have all the footage? Is there a story you want to tell, or does it present itself? Boy, this is a great question, Tyler. Um, a little bit of everything. So no, the, the order uh, of the show is not in the order we shot, but we do have a very clear idea of what the order of the show will be. Myself and Sylvia Kaminer, my director, talk it out before we arrive, because um, mainly because of wardrobe. Um, because if I'm going from scene to scene and now I'm in one show, I'm in what, like pair of pants and then all of a sudden I'm in a different outfit, it looks kind of strange. So you want continuity in wardrobe if it seems like it's like in one day. But also we, we try to connect the scenes um, and, and in a way that's not using the typical VO. And by that, I mean like after I met Gonzo, I went on to the brewery. We don't, we don't, we don't want that. So we wanna know how the show is laid out. We want a very good idea so we can kind of um, shoot it in the way we're going to edit it, if that makes any sense. Um, and sometimes we, we just th throw that away and be like, you know what, this scene works better here. And I don't care the fact that I'm in a dress in this scene and I'm in pants the other, I'll, 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 I'll write back to that letter that's like, you are in pants. Um, whatever, it's better for the story. And is there a story you want to tell or does it present itself? That, that's a great question. I, I would say for most of the time, I would say season one, especially that the season we're about to, we're showing today and moving on Wednesday, um, I'm sorry, every Wednesday from now on, I just let the let the city or the destination be who it was. And I, 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 I let it kind of present it in, in the editing room. And now that I really know what what I'm going for, I would say that there is a story I want to tell, but I would I would say that the story that I want to tell is always the one of the soul of the place, of the heart and soul. That there are destinations, there are experiences, but it's about the people and their effort to create experiences that we just get to show up and have. And so uh, sometimes I would say a lot of times there's this beautiful through line and that we can kind of connect the dots. Um, but other times we, we definitely let, let, the, let, the, let the destination be what it is and show us in the end. And, um, and I like that a lot. You just get a little nervous. You're like, oh gosh, I hope, I hope we did okay. So you wanna make sure that you're, you're really, um, you, know, you just fall in love with these destinations and you wanna make sure you're doing them right every single day. Um, Samantha, that was beautifully said, but I have been called out by our friends at Sochi. Oh, yeah. I did make well, two batches, show? so I'm gonna go on mute because it's gonna be loud. So carry on. I'm oh my gosh. Finish my okay. <laughs> but maybe, you know, I said this is behind the scenes and, and um, on my Instagram, I posted the fact that I've been doing this for 20 years. And I would say that when I first got this job with the Travel Channel, uh, so many phenomenal memories with with that beloved network. I had so many, made so many great friends and, and learned my craft as it were. When I got the job 20 years ago, I auditioned. People were like, how did you get that job? And I auditioned. And um, my audition was in Jacksonville, Florida with a phenomenal production company called Pine Ridge Film and Television. Jerry Smith, the uh, owner of that, look at him shake those margaritas. And I had to fly down to Jacksonville and audition for the host of a travel channel show. I didn't know what it was going to be. And the audition simply was me improving. So if people ever asked me um, at the beginning of years, how did you get that job? I knew how to improv. I went to school, Syracuse University for the performing arts and spent a tremendous amount of time learning um, improv skills and, and uh, um, just, you know, theater in general, but I had to improv the whole entire scene. And why that was important is that as the host of any host of any series, whether it's a series about building things or, I don't know, cooking things or traveling to places, the, the role of the host is to drive the action while being, um, entertaining, being informative, and being concise. 
and and I was able to do that. And so that is in still to this day my belief as what a host does. We prepare. We I never wing it, but um, once I get into the scene with the people, um, I let everything go and I'm just there. But I'm always crafting the seed. I'm always trying to drive it forward. And I'm always trying to add more so that the person feels that they can add more. And then I need to cap it. And so that's how I got the job. I could do that. I wasn't that good 20 years ago. I will say that. I've certainly gotten better. Um, but um, it was uh, a part of the job that still to this day, I, you know, um, it's, it's still about I'm the host. I'm there to drive the scene. I'm there to inform, entertain, and I'm there to end the scene. That's that's and that's that's the hardest part of the host is how do you cap it? Um, and I remember I learned that from my great friend Jerry Smith. Cap the scene, Samantha. He would say, know how to cap it. You know, it, it, listen to what they're saying. Always listen. Always listen, and then bring it in, and then end the scene. If you don't end it. It's 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 hard for the editor to go to the next scene. So um, there's some there's some crafting to it. There is some there is some skill of being a host uh, of a travel series. <laughs> oh gosh, Carrie Carter, I've seen the audition tape. <laughs> you were always a natural. Yes, that's so funny that there is an audition tape out there. Carrie Kyler is one of my good friends from the Travel Channel. Um, we have both moved on to great things in life, but the Travel Channel was certainly a seminal part of our careers. And Carrie was uh, a head of programming for a while, right? Um, and we would always hang out when we were at the Travel Channel socials. Um, so <laughs> good friend there. But yeah, there is an audition tape. Um, 22 years old now at this point. And I think I had orange hair. <laughs> Any other good? Uh, just so you know, uh, our good friend Roxanne's on. She's made some. Roxanne? Great, great to see that. Oh, she's, wonderful. She's, uh, for the community cloth, the woman that we interviewed there. Yes, um, absolutely. Oh, Roxanne, hello. And <laughs> I hope the Sochi people are happy now that I'm my second half of the cocktail. Yeah, yeah. The, those cocktails were pretty, you know, it's, um, um, you know, of course, Hugo is a chef where there are 21 ingredients in his mole and there are 41 ingredients in his margaritas. <laughs> yes, you're right. Uh, I think this is a good one. Duncan says, hello, Duncan. Nice to see you again. Um, Duncan says, yeah, the audition tape is on your 10 and your anniversary show. You are absolutely right. For my 10th year anniversary with the Travel Channel, um, they show the, the tape much to my chagrin. I mean, there's just things you never want to see again. But uh, but yeah, and one day, maybe next week or in a few weeks, I'll tell you how um, I, I put myself in front of a plane to get to the audition that got me the job on the Travel Channel. But that's a, a little longer story, and I know we're getting a little long in time right now. Um, hi guys from Dallas, Juliet Suarez Vega, hello. I, I hope you saw um, the Dallas episode in season three. I was born in Dallas, Texas, uh, Juliet. So I have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of um, a fondness for Texas and in, in season one, which we'll see in a few weeks as Hill Country, Texas. So right after Houston, in terms of scheduling the show, we went right straight to Hill Country, Texas to film episode two of, of uh, Places to Love. And that was a, a wonderful episode too. So um, yeah, good good, good stuff all around. Um, our friend Ke Kevin Haney asked what our crew does when not traveling with us. And uh, two of our crew, not they all cry. of our crew. They just cry. They cry. <laughs> um, but our, our director of photography and our sound engineer, their other show is Hoarders. Oh no. <laughs> so we, you go from crawling around in garbage, you know, with rats running around your feet. And if anyone's seen the show Hoarders, you you know what I'm talking about. Just, you know, difficult circumstances. Imagine doing a job, production job with a camera and equipment in environments like that. Because it's real. It's not, it's not fake. But then they get to do our show and have cocktails. And, you know, it's, it's a nice, uh, I think, uh, difference for them. I think they prefer Hoarders to be get to... Probably, yeah. <laughs> 
And, and also uh, just a little nod to Chad Finley. I don't know if he's watching right now. He's our sound engineer. When we do live music, like we did with the Stuffers and Cam, um, uh, we don't just show up with the boom. He uh, he has talks with the with their engineer a few days to a week before we're supposed to show up. We plan everything, um, and so he can kind of he can plug in right into their board. So I we're not just had to doing what. There's a guy who pays the bills. I had to rent a board for that scene so that we could do that properly, that he could get all that right. recorded properly. Kevin is big on sound and music. And so you can bet that whenever we do music, we put the extra money in so that you're hearing it in the in the best way possible. So, uh, and, and, and music scenes are tough because with the Continental Club, we couldn't have a real live audience. I mean, we had a live audience. If you notice, Gonzo was in there front row with me dancing around, but they all had to be a part of, they were sort of extras, you know, come and support the band. Yeah, your cousin showed up and stuff. So we, there are there are definitely places where no, it's just normal people milling and seating about, seating about, and then other places where it's kind of locked down, and we want to control the situation more. We absolutely bring in our own people because, um, yeah, I, you just I've been in way too many situations late at night in in drinking establishments and music venues where people kind of get out of control, and it's interesting when people see cameras how much more out of control they get. So uh, it's just a matter of uh, protecting the band, protecting us, um, and just making sure this is just kind of, it's a closed set in, in a way. No one's getting paid, <laughs> but, uh, as they would like in an equity or a SAG um, uh, 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 production, but um, we do try to control it whenever, whenever we can. Uh, a couple quick question, answers. Um, someone asked where we stayed when we were there. We stayed at the Hilton Americas downtown um, right, the, the next hotel over is the Marriott, or the Marriott Marquis, I think, uh, or the JW Marriott. It's right next to that, right next to the convention center. And that's where Sochi is located, actually. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And then... So, and... What's that? And isn't right now, in terms of an update, Sochi is closed right now? Sochi's temporarily closed. Temporarily, right? But all three of the, the rest of his restaurants are open. So they are, they're working hard for the people of Houston. Uh, Chad Finley is watching. Hey, Chad. Yay! Our sound engineer. Uh, I think we are with our questions for Houston. And one last uh, call for any questions before we call tonight. It's funny, it's, we've gotten this comment so much ever since we started doing this that you know, your shows should really be 45 minutes or they should be an hour. It's like, well, we've done that. <laughs> By the time we stop it and chat and then start it again and stop, it's an hour. So we, it, yeah, 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 so true. Marriott Marquis. Okay, that's it. Um, yeah, but, uh, it's, so Sochi's temporarily closed, but again, anyone that's in Houston, the other restaurants that uh, Chef Hugo and his wife own are all open. That's Hugo's Caracol and Backstreet Cafe. And they're all awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So thank you, Houston. Um, uh, uh, Gonzo's saying, will you come back? <laughs> absolutely. We're definitely coming back. You already told us. We just got the tip of the iceberg. So we're going to expect Gonzo to be our uh, producer for this, for the next show, right? <laughs> no, we love Houston. Houston is uh, really close to our heart because you were number one. And um, everyone opened their businesses up to us, their hearts up to us, their passions in a way that um, just just made the show, well, this is the season that won the Emmy. Let me just tell you that. And uh, we're really proud of that. And thank you so much, Houston, for starting it all. Yeah. All right, we, uh, are you signing off? Is that a sign off? Yeah, good night, Debbie. All right, all right good night. Good to see you. Have Good a good night. sabbatical. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. See you next week at 9 p.m. on Wednesday. For we're doing the Bernie's Oberlin region of Switzerland, right? Is that episode two? Oh, my two? gosh. Boy, I wish it was there. Yeah. Yep. No, oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Good night, everyone. Good stuff. Thanks, good night. Thanks, everyone.